a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today we have the 6th of October 2017. It's been quite a while since I produced my last English spoken video because, as you know from my announcement for October, I am busy reading and uploading then directly the complete book of Martin Luther, which in English is called Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil. I promised my German brethren that when there is interest for that, that I will upload this book, trying to do that in the whole month of October, because I do this in dedication to the Reformation and to Martin Luther, who on the 31st of October of this year, 2017, we can celebrate of the 500th anniversary of his nailing of the 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg in Germany, which really put the Reformation into a turbo uh, into a turbo gear, I would like to, to call it. So, because of that, I'm reading that book against the, pap uh, the Roman papacy and institution of the devil in German. I have completed my reading. I only have eight or nine pages left to record in, in doing that, and so I will use the rest of the month uploading German videos, most and for all, very, very few English-spoken videos. This is one that I will upload today, and um, this one is uh, because I received uh, some time ago um, from my brother in Christ in the United States of America a package with books, which I'm very, very grateful for, from Brett Norman. And um, in one of the boxes that I received, there was a wonderful book from Martin Luther, uh, Volume 41, Luther's Works, Church and Ministry. And in that book, Martin Luther, uh, there is the translation of the English work against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. And that gave me already the idea to, uh, to, read, uh, to, to get that book in German and read that. So in this box, with all the, video, with all the books that he sent me, there was a little uh, magazine that is called Truth in History that you see on your screen here already right now. Um, this is something that comes out every three months, as you can see. This is the September to December 2017 edition. Um, that's in the latest uh, box that he sent me. And, uh, of course, this little magazine also deals with Martin Luther and the 500 years of Reformation. Um, it has a few articles in there, like A Mighty Fortress is Our God, What Do We Owe to the Reformation, Woman in the Wilderness, it deals with Martin Luther on the one hand, it gives us a little bit background information about William Tyndale, about John Huss, uh, and about John Wycliffe. And um, those are the foremost, quote-unquote, fathers of the Reformation, even though that my opinion, but that's only my opinion, you don't have to share that, but in my point of view, um, there is no Reformation at all. Now, what does Jörg say right now here? There is no Reformation at all. Yes, there is not. And I'm going to tell you why. Just a second. So, yeah, I was interrupted, and um, the camera that I was using to produce this video uh, did not record any sound, but I had my backup sound, so that's why you even see this very first four minutes or something that I recorded. Now I switched on the audio also in the recording with the camera, 
and we can proceed to part two of this uh, recording here. Um, and I was also interrupted by a telephone call, which of course you don't know. So I'm sorry for that. But the point is, um, uh, what does Jörg say right now? There was no reformation. Well, I think the more that you are busy with studying history and the Bible, and when you come to the conclusion, like every quote-unquote reformer came, and to the conclusion that actually Daniel came in the Old Testament, or the Law and the Prophets, the conclusion that Paul came to, and the conclusion that John came to, the Revelator, we know that the Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan, and because it is the synagogue of Satan, it is irreformable. So there was no reformation, but there was a great calling out, as God tells us in Revelation 18, you know. When we go to Revelation 18 in the King James Bible, we have the first few verses where God calls us out of that apostate system. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. That's the point. God is calling people out of that apostate church that claims to be the church of Jesus Christ. But there is no reformation of that church. There is only a big calling out. And the start of protestantism and that's what we are dealing with and that's what we are dealing with today also in this video so this little booklet that i gathered here together from uh, brother brett norman starts with an article um, that's uh, posing the question what do we owe to the reformation as you can see right here okay uh, I'm just dealing with the left side here. What do we owe to the Reformation? You that are walking by faith and enjoying peace with God by simple trust in the precious blood of atonement, never forget that you owe this priceless privilege to the quote-unquote Reformation, to the awakening of the Protestants, I'd rather call it. What do we owe to them? And remember, this uh, is written from an English perspective. Point number one. The Reformation delivered England from gross religious ignorance and spiritual darkness. Well, that is not only England, that also goes for the whole of Europe. Especially when we take into account Martin Luther, who is on the top of this picture, as you can see here, here in the middle, that is Martin Luther. Okay, this is blue, so then you know that we are reading this. I'm going to put this blue, then you know we don't read this. We are reading this part and white. And here in the middle the th uh, of the three pictures, I think one is Wycliffe and one is uh, Calvin, and this is uh, Luther in any, uh, uh, in any matter. Um, we have to understand that they did the big calling out into Protestantism, to protest the Antichrist. Not only in England, but for most of Europe. Not all of Europe, but most of Europe, especially Northern Europe. Germany, Poland, Hungary, Bohemia, Denmark, Sweden, Norway. You know, all the, uh, uh, even uh, the low countries, what we call today Netherlands. And, uh, and Flanders, what today is for most of the part Belgium, even the north of France. <clears throat> the Reformation delivered England from gross religious ignorance and spiritual darkness. The religion of our English forefathers before the Reformation was a religion without knowledge, without faith, without lively hope. A religion without justification, regeneration and sanctification. A religion without any clear views of Christ and the Holy Ghost. It was a religion based on the dogmas of the Roman Catholic teaching. Yeah? So these six points that I'm reading here to you, is, uh, by the way, come from uh, Bishop John C. Ryle. Who do you know, of course, from my reading of All Roads Lead to Rome, where he is mentioned abundantly. 
Point 2. The Reformation delivered England from the most groveling, childish and superstitious practice in religion. I allude especially to the worship of relics. Because what does God say in the second commandment? Thou shalt make no images and shalt not bow down thyself to them. Let's just see what does God say about images. We go to Exodus chapter 20, so the second book of Moses, and we read about this Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, is commandment number one. And thou shalt make unto thee thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the way uh, in, in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. So when Anglican Bishop J.C. Ryle alludes especially to the worship of relics, that's the same as images. You know, relics are the dead bones of quote-unquote holy men of the Roman Catholic Church. Those are relics but also idols. And that's why I include these graven images as the King James Bible speaks here about that. Okay. Point number three that J.C. Ryle makes is the Reformation delivered England from the degrading tyranny and swindling impostures of the Roman priesthood. In the last days of the Pope's supremacy in this land, the laity were truly set upon by the clergy and could hardly call their souls their own. Yeah, because the Pope claimed to be the quote-unquote owner of the souls, to be the epitome of the conscience of the people. He, the Pope of Rome, controls the conscience of the people. There was no freedom of conscience, as there was no freedom of speech, no freedom of thought in the Dark Ages. And that's what J.C. Ryle alludes here to. The clergy could hardly call, the, the laity could hardly call their souls their own, because they were controlled by the clergy, the Roman Catholic hierarchy. Point four. The Reformation delivered England from the worst plague that can afflict a nation. I mean the plague of unholiness and immorality among the clergy. The lives of the clergy, as a general rule, were simply scandalous, and the moral tone of the laity was naturally at the lowest ebb. Of course, when your leaders have no moral, the people who follow the leaders have no moral. And that's why there was no moral and no morality in the nation of England at that time, in the whole of Europe at that time, anyway. Part point five. First and foremost, we owe to the Reformation an English Bible, and liberty for every man, woman and child in the land to read it. With an English Bible came in the right and duty of private judgment, and the assertion of the great principle of our sixth article that, quote, Holy Scripture contains all things needful to salvation, unquote, and the only rule of faith and practice. Holy Scripture is the only rule of faith and practice, and not the dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church or anything the Pope says or dogmatically, dogmatically puts upon us. Of all the agencies which brought about the overthrow of popery in this country, the translation of the Bible was the earliest and most powerful. Why? Well, because the translation of the Bible into the vulgar tongue, into the tongue of the normal laity, the normal people, set the normal people free. The Bible is the light. Yeah? And in the Dark Ages, there was no light because there was no Bible. There was no Word of God. 
and if it was preached from the pulpit in the churches, if it was even preached or taught from there, it was taught in Latin. And the people didn't understand Latin. And the people were illiterate. There were no schools like today. People were kept ignorant and dumb. They are kept ignorant and dumb too, today, but with other reasons. Today we go to school and think we are smart. Well, and then comes in entertainment <laughs> from the Jesuits and makes us dumb again. But at that time, people didn't even have the chance to be literate. They couldn't even read because there were just no schools. No, no, nobody taught them anything. Point six that we have to owe to the Reformation. The huge mass of rubbish was shoveled out of the way by the Reformers. People were taught that justification was by faith without the deeds of the law and that every heavily, heavy laden sinner on earth had a right to go straight to the Lord Jesus Christ for remission of sins without waiting for Pope or priest, confession or absolution, masses or extreme unction. A very important point. Back to the Bible. That's what the Reformation was. That was what that big calling out and starting of Protestantism was all about. To go straight to the Lord Jesus Christ to have a personal relationship for the remission of sins without waiting for the Pope or Priest, without confession in the confession box, which the Roman Catholic Church abused to the highest degree, without any absolution from a priest, without masses, without the Eucharist, without the dogma of transubstantiation in the Mass, and without extreme unction. Very important. Those were these six points that we owe to the quote-unquote Reformation. Those were the six points that we owe to the Great Awakening of Protestantism, as I rather like to call it. Now, we're going to change and read on on the next page. And we read about John Wycliffe. As you have probably seen as I opened this paper, and you can see here, this is on page 11 of 14 of this uh, document. Um, the point that I want to make is um, this booklet starts out with something else. It starts out with Luther, but the Reformation, if we can call it still that way, you understand my point now, I will not always say that it's the starting of the calling out of Protestantism. I call it the Reformation, but you can understand it the way that you want to understand it anyway. Um, this book starts with Luther and then goes on to Tyndale and then Huss and then Wycliffe, but Wycliffe is the oldest one and that's why we are reading about him right now. And I will gladly tell you about what Wycliffe is all about and what Wycliffe taught and what was Wycliffe's um, uh, role in the quote-unquote Reformation. So we're going to read this here. During the dark days of Rome's control over the people of England, God anointed a man whose work would light a fire of biblical reformation that has lasted to this very day. John Wycliffe, some also pronounce it Wycliffe, I pronounce it Wycliffe, known as the Morning Star of the Reformation, at the predestined uh, predestined time in history was used of God to awaken the people of England to the truths of the Bible that had been hid from them for so long. He began the work of Bible translation, the examination of many Roman dogmas, and sent throughout the country poor priests, who were known as Lollards, to preach the good news of salvation by grace. His work was the breaking of the dawn of gospel light over the people of Britain. His work of even translating the Bible from the existing Latin Bible into the common language English was the breaking of the dawn and that's why he is called the morning star of the Reformation. John Wycliffe lived between 1329 and 1384 AD. He was born in Hipswell of Yorkshire, England. 
He attended Oxford University and later became master and remained connected with it for the rest of his life. While at Lutterworth, rectory as uh, he began to speak against the authority of the Pope and published his ideas in tracts and leaflets. And this is something that we can uh, take notice of, but to publish ideas in tracts and leaflets did not get the same response as the nailing of the 95 Theses that Luther nailed to the church door in Wittenberg uh, about a hundred years later. Um, or anywhere, yeah, about a hundred years or even more years later. At that time, Luther could fall back to the uh, press of Gutenberg that was not in existence at that time of Wycliffe. And that's why his leaflets and tracts, of course, did not uh, get the same attendance and uh, did not get spread in the same way as Luther's 95 Theses and other works later, of course, got distributed. We have to take that into account. John Wycliffe lived in another time. He lived in the 14th century and Luther did his work in the beginning of the 16th century. So that's quite a difference, right? We have to take that into consideration. Now in 1377, Wycliffe was summoned before the tribunal of the Bishop of London at St. Paul's. Wycliffe had strong support of the people while being condemned by the Pope. So that means that was a grassroots supported movement from Wycliffe. The people loved him, the people loved his preaching, the people loved his leaflets and his tracts because they saw the truth in it. But of course, the Pope, the Curia, the whole Roman Catholic hierarchy did not approve of Wycliffe. He clearly denounced the sovereignty of the Pope while acknowledging the Bible as the only source of truth. And who is sovereign in the Bible to all of us? Jesus Christ, not the Pope, not a fallible man, but Jesus Christ, the wonderful Son of God who died for us on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Now, Wycliffe denounced, first, the, infallib the infallibility of both Pope and Council. Because you have to understand, and that's something that we go into later when we go into this uh, wonderful book of uh, Luther that I mentioned, Luther's Works, Volume 41, when we go into that book, you will understand that the Pope always uh, declares the councils infallible and only the Pope could call a council. <laughs> so the infallible man could only introduce infallible councils. And this infallibility of both the Pope and the council was denounced by John Wycliffe. Papal decrees are not in agreement with scripture. True. And that's why Wycliffe denounced these papal decrees. Wycliffe also denounced the dogma of transubstantiation. Now, what is the dogma of transubstantiation? I will take a picture here, and um, you have probably seen that already in videos before of mine. The dogma of transubstantiation is a very important dogma of the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah? And uh, we get the picture here. And what is the dogma of transubstantiation? That is that during Mass, a Roman Catholic priest speaks the words hoc est corpus enem meum. And by that, the priest with his hocus pocus claims and the priest and the Roman Catholic hierarchy claim that by speaking these words, this little host, this little wafer, this little piece of bread is transformed into the divinity, humanity, flesh, blood, body and soul of our Savior Jesus Christ. 
the creature can recreate the creator in this little host, in this little bread that is then later put in the monstrance. That is a sacrifice. That is one of the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. The dogma of transubstantiation without there is no salvation, they claim. And this Wycliffe denounced. Because in the Bible it is said that Jesus broke the bread and gave to his disciples and said to them, Eat, this is my body, and this do in remembrance of me. And the conclusions that you come from when you read the Catechism of the Council of Trent that took place between 1545 and 1563, the dogma of the transubstantiation, it is said in that Catechism of the Council of Trent that whoever says, believes and practices as it is stated in the Bible, that you do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ instead of accepting that the priest changed this little piece of round bread into the divinity, humanity, blood, flesh, soul and spirit of Jesus Christ. When you do not accept that, you are anathema. So Wycliffe already in the, 1400, in, the, in the 1300s, in the 14th century, denounced the dogma of transubstantiation. He also denounced purgatory. And he denounced clerical, luvish, l l clerical rulership over the laity. Because, according to the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are all brothers and sisters, and there is one head, Jesus Christ. And we are all the same. There is no clerical rulership. There is no hierarchy within these churches. Of course you have positions like deacons and bishops and all that stuff. But they are all the same. It is an office that they fulfill to fulfill the work of the Lord. Not because it is a hierarchy. There is no hierarchy ordained in the body of Christ. The only hierarchy there is, is we are all brothers and sisters in our Lord, and He is our Lord. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and He is the Master of our Church. Jesus Christ, He alone. There is no clerical rulership, and this also Wycliffe denounced. In, 18, uh, in 1380, he enlisted a group of poor priests, known as Lollards, as evangelists to proclaim his views throughout the land of Britain. Yeah. So, we continue on the next page here. The white one. When he was prohibited from preaching by the Archbishop of London, Wycliffe retired to his rectory and devoted himself to the first translation of the Bible into the English language in 1382 and the promotion of his views in leaflets to be distributed to the common people. His writings were repressed by papal authority. Thirty-one years after his death at the Council of Constance in 1415, and by the way that is where they lured Huss into and killed Huss and Hieronymus, his books were ordered to be burned, and his remains to be exhumed and burned. This was carried out in 1428 by the order of Pope Martin V, and his ashes were thrown into the river Swift. So years and years after Wycliffe was dead and buried, they dug up the bones, burned the bones, and threw the ashes into the river Swift. That is how much the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope, and the whole hierarchy of the synagogue of Satan hates someone who speaks the truth. Through the work of this man, Wycliffe, God lit a spiritual fire throughout Britain and Europe to set the people free 
from the religious bondage of papal Rome and her various spiritual heresies. John Wycliffe himself wrote, quote, Holy Scripture is the preeminent authority for every Christian and the rule of faith. For as much as the Bible contains all that is necessary for salvation, it is necessary for all men, not for priests alone. It alone, the Scripture, is the supreme law that is to rule the Church, without human traditions and statutes. Christ and his apostles taught the people in the language best known to them. Therefore, the doctrine should not only be in Latin, but in the common tongue. The laity ought to understand the faith and, as doctrines of our faith are in the scriptures, believers should have the scriptures in a language which they fully understand. Unquote. And that language is not Latin. That language is the language that you are risen with. English when you're in England, German when you're in Germany, Spanish when you're in Spain, Italian when you're in Italy, or maybe there it's also Latin at that time. <laughs> no, Italian was there. You get it. Yeah? The tongue of the quote-unquote lay people, of the quote-unquote normal people. Believers should have the scriptures in a language which they fully understand. And that led us later to the King James Bible, of course. So far, the articles about Wycliffe. Wycliffe. Now, we go a few pages back here. And uh, we read about John Huss. Only the white page. Okay. Why do I go from Wycliffe to Huss? Well, because he lived in the same time frame as John Wycliffe. So when we are going to make, when I'm going to make a video here a little bit about the quote-unquote reformation, about the awakening of Protestantism, about the awakening in Europe to the scriptures, then I will try to do it in a way that we are going also in the same time frame. So, but before we turn to John Huss, there's one little sentence that I don't want to uh, withhold from you that we just saw here in the last page. And um, that is what the Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury wrote concerning John Wycliffe. That is what the Roman Catholic hierarchy thinks today and thought at that time of John Wycliffe. Quote, that pestilent and most wretched John Wycliffe of damnable memory, a child of the old devil, and himself a child or pupil of Antichrist, crowned his wickedness by translating the scriptures into the mother tongue. Unquote. Crowned his wickedness by translating the scriptures into the mother tongue. This is how much the Roman Catholic Church hates the Bible, people whether you like it or not, but that is the real face of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury says here that John Wycliffe crowned his wickedness by translating the scriptures into the mother tongue, into the tongue of the lay people, into the tongue of the normal person, the person in the street. That is wickedness, according to a Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury. That is wickedness. Okay. So, we turn to the article of John Huss in this magazine called Truth in uh, History. This is written by Charles A. Jennings. And Charles A. Jennings, you probably from my channel know, because he was the author or the co-author of the book The Origin of Preterism and Futurism that I discussed with Tom Fress. I'm still not done uploading all parts of these because there are 14 and I think there are 10 or 11 uploaded so far on my channel. Uh, keep, uh, keep a look on that uh, if you want to. 
uh, when you go to my channel, there is a playlist that is uh, called Hour of the Truth Meets Inquisition Update. And uh, in there, there are all the readings of that book. And that was written or co-authored by Charles A. Jennings, who is the author of this article about John Huss. And we start by reading a quote from Huss. He says, I would not, for a chapel full of gold, recede from the truth. Unquote. God stirred the spirit of a young Roman Catholic priest of Bohemia to proclaim the message of reform during a time of the most spiritual darkness in Europe. John Huss was born about 1369 in Usinek, in today's Czech Republic. The name Huss meant goose, which is a shortened term of Husinek, of Usinek. Born of peasant parents, Hus desired the priesthood to escape his poverty. Now I gotta make a little comment here. I'm about to read. I started already reading from Charles, uh, from Henry Charles Lear, a three-volume book on the history of the Inquisition in the Middle Ages. And uh, I'm, I'm reading that only in German because that's about 1,800 pages uh, in, in <laughs> one work all three volumes and i'm not gonna read 1800 pages in german and then 1800 pages in english in english if you want to learn about the inquisition and what i do in reading for the inquisition uh, i can advise you to go to my uh, youtube channel joggers war on this info that is here in the picture and there you can see the latest video that i uploaded there the persecutions of the popes against heretics and of the albigenses and waldenses i read here this is one part of the book. I read here the history of the Inquisition, as you can see here, this playlist. And that is a book from Philip van Limborch, who wrote this book in 1692, that was translated in 1731 into English. And I read here about the Inquisition and its history, but in German I read from Henry Charles Lear, um, History of the Inquisition in the Middle Ages. And in that book, the author tells us about how people could escape poverty and illiteracy in the Middle Ages. And that was to join the clergy, to join the Roman Catholic Church. That was the only source of power at that time. And when people wanted to escape poverty, like John Huss wanted to do, they joined the Roman Catholic Church. You didn't even have to be a believer. You don't have to be a believer today when you want to join the Roman Catholic Church. But you didn't even have at that time to have a believer. You wanted to escape your normal surroundings. You wanted to escape the treadmill of what you were other ways, uh, another way born in and wanted to lead another life than your father and mother did. You maybe wanted to prosper, so then you went to the clergy. And of course, that's why they desired priesthood. And that's why a lot of so many bad people went into the clergy at that time. Because also, criminal minds wanted to escape that normal world. And they went into the clergy. Robbers, rapists, thieves, murderers. They all went into the clergy. Because there was really a career to be made. Not in the normal life. There were no careers to be made. You have to understand that from the Dark Ages. That's also a reason why it's called the Dark Ages. Because dark people ruled over the normal people. Born of peasant parents, the author says here, has desired the priesthood to escape his poverty. I'll just explain to you why. He earned a master's degree from Charles University in 1396 and became professor of theology at the university in 1398. Huss entered the priesthood in 1400 and pastored Prague, uh, and pastored Prague Bethlehem Chapel. Huss read the writings of John Wycliffe, calling for reform in the practice and theology of the church. Now, King Richard II, who lived between 1367 and 1400, of England married Anne, the sister of the King of Bohemia, opening the door for Wycliffe's writings to enter Bohemia. 
Now, this is the hand of God, right? Do you see that? Because of this marriage between King Richard II in, uh, marrying this Anne, the sister of the King of Bohemia, the door was opened to Wycliffe's writings into Bohemia so that John Huss and other people could get even get knowledge of them, which they otherwise would have never got to know. Wycliffe's writings awakened Huss to the unscriptural practices of Romanism. Because when you always, when you are just joining the clergy and you learn of the Roman Catholic hierarchy and you learn of the Catholic dogmas, you all take that for truth because you don't know otherwise. But here Huss was exposed to the writings of Wycliffe and he could all of a sudden see that the practices of Romanism are unscriptural. Now he said, quote, I desire to hold, believe and assert whatever is contained in scripture as long as I have breath in me, unquote. In 1405, Antichrist Pope Innocent VII demanded that Huss' writings be burned. Huss denounced, first of all, the dogma of, oh, where have we read that before? The dogma of transubstantiation. Huss denounced also the subservience to the Pope. He also denounced the unconditional obedience. Now, how do we know? Uh, what is another word that we know of unconditional obedience? Obedience as a cadaver, as we learned from the Jesuits. Perende ac cadaver. Cadaver gehorsam, as I always say in German unconditional obedience that's something that has denounced oh we have unconditional obedience to our lord and savior jesus christ to our father who is in heaven but not to a mere man not to the roman catholic hierarchy not to a priest bishop cardinal or pope in rome so has denounced unconditional obedience to earthly rulers not to the Lord, not to our Father in heaven, but unconditional obedience to earthly rulers has denounced. He also denounced absolution by vicarious priests. He denounced belief in saints and he denounced simony. Now you ask, what is simony? Because, you know, some people follow my work, some people don't. Some people know, some people don't. Simony is the buying of ecclesiastical positions, meaning of offices within the Roman Catholic hierarchy. For example, but not excluding, uh, mean not exclusive, buying of the papal chair. And there have been examples like this over and over again. For that, I advise you to, for example, turn to my readings of Babylon Mystery Religion, where I read the whole, read the whole book of Ralph Woodrow and we come across simony. I advise you to read the book from um, Dave Hunt, uh, A Woman Rides the Beast. He goes into that extensively in his book. I advise you, of course, to go to several readings of uh, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, who mentioned this. And the name Simony that we read here, the name Simony comes from Simon, but not Simon Peter, not the Peter from the Bible, but from the Simon that we know from uh, the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, let me just turn to there. I think it is in the 8th chapter, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, you know, when you're doing something li like this live, you have no way to test it before. Uh, then we are going to um, make acquaintance in verses uh, 8, I think, and forth going. But there was a certain man called Simon. Yeah? You read this here? This is Acts chapter 8 and verse 9. So when you read, want to read the whole stuff for better understanding, please do so. I don't have the time to do this in this video. 
there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the last to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter, the disciple, the apostle Peter, and John, the revelator, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they were all baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, but the Holy Spirit was not yet fallen upon them. So Peter and John came down to Samaria and then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. And that is the root of simony. Simon offers money for the gift of spreading the Holy Ghost. That's how that name simony arises from. From Simon, not Simon Peter the Apostle, but from Simon, who in Samaria saw that when they laid their hands on the people, they received the Holy Ghost, and he saw that, he offered them money. He said, as we continue in verse 19, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness, and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon, and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. I'm not going to continue, but this little interlude that we had here, very important. And, uh, of course, Simon answered and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, because he knew that he didn't have the Spirit. He knew, Simon knew, that he was not a righteous man, and you know, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. But the prayer of an unrepentant sinner is worth nothing. And this is where the name simony comes from. And uh, I think this is quite important that we go a little bit into that, because John Huss denounced simony. Now we know at least what simony is. Huss denounced the selling of indulgences, well, that was the basis for Martin Luther when he nailed his 95 Theses on the church door in Wittenberg. All his 95 Theses were about indulgences, because indulgences is the same as simony. Why? Well, because indulgences is the selling of salvation, the selling of forgiveness. But only God can forgive sins and not a man when you pay him money. And that's what indulgences are. So Huss denounced the selling of indulgences and was forced into exile. The Pope summoned him to appear not 
uh, the Pope summoned him to appear at a council in Constance, Germany, in November 1414. His friends urged him not to attend. Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund and Antichrist Pope John the Twenty-Third assured us a safe journey and fair treatment. They did what? The Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire at that time and the Pope assured John Huss a safe journey and fair treatment. Huss believed he would receive a fair hearing to represent his views and return home safely. Instead, he was arrested and placed in the dungeon prison in a Dominican convent. The Dominicans, who later became the order that forced the Inquisition, no, no, not later, the Dominicans already were, I'm sorry, yeah, we are in the 14th century, uh, the Dominican order was the order that was ordered with the Inquisition at that time. So he was put into a dungeon prison in a Dominican convent, that means that he was given into the hands of the Inquisitors. The summer of 1415 he was tried and condemned as a religious heretic, taken to Constance Cathedral, where church officials celebrated the Mass and read to him his sentence as he sat on a high stool. It read, quote, The Holy Council, having God only before its eyes, well, what God? The God of the Holy Council, the God of the Roman Catholic Church, which is the God of the dead, which is the Prince of the air, which is the God of this world, which is Satan. The Holy Council, having God only before its eyes, condemns John Huss to have been and to be a true, real and open heretic. The disciple not of Christ, but of John Wycliffe. Unquote. The bishops removed Huss's vestments and placed upon his head a cap covered with pictures of the devil and committed his soul to hell. The council agreed, we'll cook this goose. On the way to his execution he passed a churchyard where a bonfire was burning his books. While tied to the stake with faggots around his body, Huss declared, Today you will roast a lone goose. But one hundred years from now, you will hear a swan sing, whom you will leave unroasted, and no trap nor net will catch him for you. This happened in 1415. John Huss, while tied to the stake with faggots around his body, and being burned alive, declared, Today you will roast a lone goose, but one hundred years from now you will hear a swan sing, whom you will leave unroasted, and no trap or net will catch him for you. Unquote. These words came to pass when Martin Luther an Augustinian priest resisted the Pope and nailed his 95 Theses to the door of Wittenberg Castle Church of Germany on October 31, 1517, about a hundred years after that John Huss made this announcement on the stake. This I call a prophet. This I call Biblical. As his body was being consumed by fire, Huss prayed, Christ, thou Son of the living God, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus, it is for thee that I patiently endure this cruel death. I pray thee to have mercy on my enemies. John Huss, scholar, preacher, Reformer and martyr was responsible for revealing 
the long hidden truths of God's word that would liberate the Western world from Rome's spiritual darkness and control. Have you ever been told this story in your church? Have you ever been told this story in your school? Have you ever read that in a history book? Have you ever read that in history university lessons? Have you ever seen that on Discovery Channel? I guess not. Let's retreat to William Tyndale. William Tyndale lived in the same time as Martin Luther did. He even was born later than Martin Luther. But before I will finish this video by speaking about Martin Luther, I will turn to William Tyndale. Because we are first dealing with Wycliffe, then Huss from Bohemia, who was inspired by the writings of Wycliffe, as we just learned, and now we turn again to William Tyndale, we are still dealing with the UK, with the, Uni with the United States, I want to say, <laughs> with the United Kingdom. We are dealing with England still. Yeah? And um, there will not be that much time, so I will probably do a second video on Martin Luther only, and uh, we'll just stop with this little article here on William Tyndale now. But because I see I only already have 51 minutes plus 5 minutes in the beginning, that's 56 minutes. No, I will stop even here. William Tyndale we will read next time and also Martin Luther we will read next time. Um, I, th I, I don't want to make this video too long. I rather produce another one. But, and that's what I'm going to, uh, what I want to ask my uh, dear English speaking brethren whom I produce this video for. Um, I will only produce the next, the next part and even go into the uh, introductory reading of uh, Martin Luther against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil, if you want me to. Because I can tell you one thing, I see how the German public of my channel embraces the reading that I do from Martin Luther and how many views these video gets. And I don't see the same response from my English-speaking brethren. So I would really like to hear it from you, and I want to ask you to comment beneath this video if you want me to continue this reading. Because otherwise, I will concentrate on doing my German videos for the months of October, Reformation Day. I still have other things to come in English. I want to finish this in English, but I also want to do what you are learning from a little bit. I want to edify you through the scripture, through the real history that I'm teaching here. With this little magazine that I got from Brother Brad Norman, who sent this to me, with the book of Martin Luther, I, will, I, I, I die for, to give you all this information, but I also want to know if there is any interest in really listening and watching these videos. So, this was the first little reading then of uh, Truth and History magazine. And, um, well, I hope I get enough comments that uh, makes it worth the while to come back. And then we read about William Tyndale and we read about uh, Martin Luther and we read about, of course, against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. So, thank you very much for watching, listening, and please do not forget to comment. I am not asking thumbs up or thumbs down. I don't ask any more subscriptions to my channel or whatever. I just ask an honest opinion of yours if you want me to continue this reading or not. That's all. Thank you very much for watching, listening, and commenting, and until next time, Jogler66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off, says God bless you and bye-bye. We must start at the foot of the cross, for our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. 
God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.